Good afternoon, folks. You are listening to Radio Robin Hood. This is Conversation Oasis, a weekly free-floating discussion program that comes to you here from the city center of Turku from Kasviskeda's restaurant. With me in the studio today, I have Jalal, as usual, the usual suspect owner of the <laughs> restaurant, and yes, Branku, the elaborated philosopher, and uh, Hassan, my dear friend and and a very happy man right now because he just got to know his future recently, that it's going to be here in Finland. So, we're going to talk a bit about how um, emotions guide our rational thought, and that discussion will probably be led by Branko, the philosopher, and then we will talk about integration as a topic. So Branko, you you were burning for this 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 philosophical matter of uh, emotions, the way emotions guide our rational thinking. Well, so what 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 was the point that you were so passionate about regarding this issue well, or was, matter? Well, we were so ever talking about this topic today, and also quite recently in the Philosophers Cafe uh, that Volker Spilius Rubund. Organizers. Yeah, but, the, uh, the Philosophers Cafe is a is a uh, also a discussion kind of event that are organized some Sundays in the month at Kolo Restaurant uh, by B- Folkets Buildings for Bund, usually in the Swedish in Swedish. Yeah. But this uh, parti- particular uh, cafe was about the um, problem of over intellect intellectual there. Yeah. Intellectualizing. In- intellectualizing. It's a diff- difficult word. Yeah. Intellectualizing uh, society or the way we perceive the, the society or the world in general and uh, other people and uh, over rationalization also and um, as, or viewing the society through a scientific lens. Well, when we, of course, not to say that a scientific view of the world or rational view of the world is wrong, but uh, we are also emotional beings and our way of to uh, uh, understand the world is also emotional. And even if we think rationally about uh, different problems in society, we, we have this rational way of understanding, but it's connected to an emotional view. That And it's a problem if we, it's, we disconnect it from rationality. And a good example was this one person who commented on the Philosopher's Cafe that uh, she uh, was uh, she was from Sweden, and uh, they don't call uh, pig meat, so it was kind of pig meat stew or something, and they don't call it by that name in Sweden. But she, then she came here, and it's called. It was the name of the food was in the restaurant was, was something like pig meat stew. And then she was like, oh shit, I'm eating pig. But, uh, and then she, she explained uh, that... Uh, that um, flesk, fresh, no? Yes, <laughs> flesk, they call it in yeah, Swedish. Yeah. Yeah, and she explained that in an intellectual level, she... Flesk gryta, flesk I think gryta. it would yeah. be in Swedish. In yeah. Sweden, Swedish. But mm. here it's called uh, grishat, so... Okay. But anyway, please chat, Greta. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, and basically, she said that on an intellectual level, of course, she knew that that flesk is uh, is a pig that she's eating pig, but she she never kind of had that emotional connection. That, and I uh, think, like a small note in English, just that flesk is, I think, the most the closest translated into lard. I think, right? Yeah. Or uh, yeah, I think so. Yes, large uh, is lard. is basically. Uh, I think so. I've, I'm like the sure. the fat part of the pig's meat, basically. Yeah. Flesk. But but anyway, she kind of realized that I am eating pig, and uh, and of course she she eats meat and didn't necessarily think that that uh, it's a bad. Food. Thing, but uh, but uh, she didn't have a moral issue with the meat-eating aspect of it. Yeah. Or, 
But suddenly she realized she was actually chewing on an animal's ass or what? Yes, yeah, basically. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and that, like she introduced uh, like a sense of morality into the picture, uh, whereas mm. she hasn't really problemized it before. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of and uh, I have to say that myself, I am a vegetarian, but uh, I don't I. I don't think that it's necessarily wrong to eat meat, but uh, but uh, the overproduction is a problem. So there is, a, and also the the way that we treat animals is, or is a problem, and uh, that that there is a moral aspect that has to be discussed. Several, several moral as aspects. Exactly, yeah. and uh, and uh, and we can't really like talk about it or, or understand the, the moral problem if we don't kind of have that emotional connection. And that was this was this philosophy's cafe was about, that uh, we have to kind of have this emotional connection to, to uh, different problems that, that uh, it's a problem when we can't, we can't relate to, for example, if we talk about other cultures, and we, if we can't like relate to that other cultures, you don't. Uh, if you don't have an emotional connection, then you can't like understand it. Or, or you're not responsive to 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 this other, yeah, or something. But, but like, uh, like one small note about this meat thing, Hassan in Iraq. The animals are not uh, caged there, right? Or are they? No, they should not be caged. Yeah. <laughs> like sometimes in the neighborhood, I saw some shepherd with his sheep, and they eat everything. Yeah, like they <laughs> are they are herded, I, I, or at least in Kurdistan, the Kurdistan part. But is it also the Arabic part that the animals are actually herded in the nature, like yeah, yeah, guys yeah, yeah. going? Yeah, they walk with them around. Like yeah, so it's not they are not like, yeah. fenced and caged no. like our animals. No, like or our farm farm animals. It's very different conditions under. Maybe in, like in the farm they have this fence, but they they like. But they are outside all yeah, the time. Yeah, they are outside all the time. Yeah. Right, right, and they are not so concentrated and, and cramped together. No, no, right? no. Yeah, yeah. Just but a small note that we have quite a. Bit. But when they kill them, they kill them in the public really <laughs> and brutally. Uh, How long? There is an eat or if there is a celebration. They actually cut the neck uh, of their lamb or uh, chicken in front of public, uh, just to for the feast of it or for it's a kind of ritual anyway. Yeah, uh, that's a bad part of it. But uh, b but they die quite quickly, right? Oh no! No, no really? they suffer. They really suffer. Ooh. They really suffer. But uh, uh, regarding the emotions that you mentioned. Emotion could be bad or good. Anger is emotion. Hate is emotion. And uh, that's why I think it's necessary to talk about, to be able to understand our emotions. We have to talk about them. We have to introduce them into the picture. We have to <coughs> introduce them into our way of understanding the world. Because if we don't, we kind of lose our own connection to it. For example, we feel hate, we feel anger, but uh, but, but uh, it's not wrong to be angry, or it's not even wrong to maybe hate something. We hate some f practices in the world, for example. We hate some things that people are doing. These emotions aren't wrong, but we have to be able to understand them, that we can kind of, uh, well, understand ourselves better and maybe control ourselves better, that we don't let our anger go out of hand, for example. If we talk about fear, as you mentioned before, we we started recording, like fear has a crucial uh, role in, in re let's say, quite misguiding our rational thought. Um, Want to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, getting into this political discussion, then politicians often use the re rhetoric to, to... The rhetoric of threat and fear. Yes. That, that, that we have outside threats and fears. Yes. Like or to invoke our fears to to start um, yeah. following their lead, even if it will lead us to not so good places. Yeah. For example, talking about the economics, that uh, we have to implement huge cuts because we are in danger, and uh, or the, the nation is in. Uh, our children's future is at stake. 
where, where, as, <laughs> where as actually Finland is doing quite economically well, but they have created this picture that everything is shit. But no, actually we're, we're doing quite fine in the global level. There are problems, but it's not, it's, they, it's not that bad. And actually Finland was, uh, before the cuts were implemented, a good example of how a society should function. Now somebody would probably say, like someone yeah. from, from, the, from those parties, would say probably something like, yeah, but look, now our economy is going up, it's all because of our neoliberal policies that we actually, <laughs> we have actually saved this country, that it has nothing to do with other global trends, it's all our, yeah. our achievement, probably, yeah. would, they would probably kind of say something like, in that direction, a Finnish person would never express himself like that, but, yeah. but in his passionate way, but he, he something with that, that content. Yeah. But uh, uh, Branko, I don't understand this part of the argument that uh, <coughs> you say that we should uh, relate to our uh, uh, different aspects of the life emotionally. We should use our emotions; they are good there for us to use them. But you say that uh, uh, we shouldn't be afraid and, um, of how the uh, economy looks like or how the p politics look like, so, but then uh, uh, fear is a part of uh, emotion too. You misunderstand me. I, I was just going to get yeah, into damn this. Damn you, you misunderstood <laughs> something here. No? Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> I was getting into that, uh, well of course fear can even be a good thing in a sense, but we have to understand that what we are feeling is fear. When, uh, particularly in this kind of political rhetoric, we have to understand that what we are feeling are fear. And uh, when we understand that... Uh, it's well, easier to relate to that own feeling. Yes. So that and it doesn't guide us blindly. Yes. Mm. And, uh, for example, in this political, like... Uh, politicians are saying that we should <coughs> be afraid. No, they wouldn't say it like that. But uh, there is a huge problem, we are in a crisis and, uh, pe and people think that, okay, that is rational, we should implement the cuts, then they would think, because it, this is completely rational, we are in a crisis. But what they are actually being, it's kind of, they are it being affected by this emotional thing, that, uh, that we have something to fear and we need to implement the cuts to protect ourselves. That's not what actually the politicians what the police stations are saying uh, is not that rational. It's not that like first of all, what they're saying is more to to go to to make the people vote in a certain manner. And second of all, even if these people or these parties that came into power, they said this blah blah about the cuts and we need to do this and that and and we have to save the world and economy and all is save this country. And then what they're doing is not really following. Uh, the sort of rational, I mean, in order to justify the cuts so that people won't complain too much, they use the rhetoric. Mm. But then, as, as we have seen, of course, they at the same time they l let the rich, the richer end of this population, they let their taxes slide and all these kinds of stuff that they implement laws. So, I mean, to some people, that's very obvious that it's. It's what they're doing is increasing uh, class differences in this country, making poor people poorer and women dominated branches, less, even less paid as they have been before. And at the same time, they let capital kind of increase itself so that the richest people will be easier to be even richer and pay less taxes which in practice also means they have more liquidity to, to invest and make even more money on people's cheap labor. Like in practice, if we go, now we are talking this politics again, let's back, get back to the philosophy, <laughs> uh, philosophy and emotions, because <laughs> we have been complaining so much about this government. Now, I mean, it's like hopeless. Mess. No matter what we say, they're gonna True. do what they do. Yeah. Hopefully next election, something will change, but uh, I wanted just to ask one question from Bronco. The, the, uh, the decision making nowadays is about numbers. 
And when it comes to emotion, emotion doesn't have to do anything with numbers. <coughs> emotion is about empathy or feeling or things like that. So, um, but the decision making doesn't have anything to do with how do I feel about something. It's Why not? more about, um, well, because in the end, uh, it can go wrong, but when it's, it's uh, a rational decision, you can, uh, in the end, you can see the numbers and learn through your your practical life, but through you don't, reasonability. But you, but, don't have any, but you don't have any relationship to those numbers without emotions, though. Otherwise, yes. these, mean, these numbers will not mean anything to you uh, if there is not some kind of emotions involved. Yes. So. Um, Everything, all decision making basically has to involve emotions. It's just how do we take care of our emotions and cultivate our emotional life or how to put it so that we don't do irrational and destructive decisions for us and for others, basically. Um, isn't, that, isn't that the aim of kind of clarifying in this discussion? What, what is a destructive emotion or a relationship to, or where do we, how do we orientate in this? matter of of emotion and, and rationality. The, 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 for me, the wrong thing with emotions <coughs> is that they are not measurable. How far you can go with your emotion. So how much you can get angry, how much you can express your anger or criticizing or hate or... Is it a matter, how, but, but is it but a matter of quantity, quantity or quality? Can, uh, is it a matter of quantity or quality actually when it comes to, to emotions? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you can be less angry, you can be really angry, but is there also, is it a matter of quantity or is it more like a quality? I mean, isn't, I don't know, just well, kind of a question. Is the, the balance between rationality and emotion mm -hmm. so that no, no one of these takes over in any decision you make? That's like the most balanced way of, of orientating in this world, probably. I, I have a good sample for you. The situation in Middle East is um, more about emotions and it's here emotion, it's more about rationality. Emotional mess. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's mostly about emotions. All, everybody is angry at everybody. And actually, I said that to many people recently. I saw a video that uh, the two sides uh, were involved. I don't know, it was Syria or Iraq. One side was uh, shooting a rocket and screaming or shouting Allah mm. Akbar. And the other, there was video showing the other side that receiving the rocket actually, and they were shouting also, uh, also Allah Akbar. They are both uh, Muslims, both sides, and they are <coughs> both against, of both sides against of Western country, but both sides are using Western technology to kill each other. That's emotions. But here is the result of what, 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 what made European Union a union is a rationality and discussion and... There is other aspects, there is other aspects to the European Union, but we'll get back to that yeah. in a moment. You are listening to Radio Robin Hood. This is the weekly free-floating uh, conversation program, Conversation Oasis, coming to you here from Kasviskeda's restaurant in the city center of Turku. I'm Nana Bunkvist and with me here as discussion partners, I have Jalal, Branko, and Hassan. Hassan hasn't said a word during this discussion so far. <laughs> so so hard. I <laughs> am gonna address him right now when we are at this topic of Muslim war and Allah, Allahu Akbar. Then I'm gonna <laughs> address Hassan. What do you have to say to this Middle Eastern mess? We can we can get into we can get into the integration part, which we were supposed to talk about. We can stop joking around about this, this <coughs> religious fanatism, um, and talk about I don't know religious mess. I, I don't know. It's a mess. Yeah, it's, it's a like mess. it's really mess because like a lot of people they are like just fighting over things happened fifteen thousand years ago. Um, but where did they get this idea from to they, start fighting about something? I don't know, something? I think they got it from their families or something. And where did they get it from? It's from 1500 years ago. So they have ago. been fighting since? Yeah, since 1500 years but ago. But there was a peaceful time. Wasn't like Europeans fleeing to the Middle East at some point during yeah. the Second World War? Yeah. So what happened there? Well, uh, for example, in Iraq we have the kingdom there of Iraq and then... Well, it's like, it's like since that time like when the Uthmanians mm. went away, mm. it started like the peace 
mm-hmm. until the 70s, 80s, it get, start getting worse. Right. Yeah, and Iraq has started getting worse since uh, Saddam party right. got in and right. started getting worse, 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 2003. Then 2004 it started the fight between Sunni and Shia again. Yeah, and it can be mentioned that 2003 uh, US bombed the shit out of Iraq. And, yeah. and and took, they uh, want to took bring down, freedom yeah, to Yeah, they Iraq. wanted to bring their so-called freedom. Actually, I think they just wanted the oil, yeah. but they brought Saddam down with the excuse that they will bring freedom to the people, which yeah, in so practice Saddam just... Saddam has this mass uh, weapons of mass destruction and that they are not exist. Even. So that's they how they find. justified yeah. justified that so that they would get the support from their own people. Yeah, but like I remember at that time when they put this uh, Paul Bremer, the civilian governor of Iraq, it's assigned by America, it's American. Then they made a mini parliament for Iraq and then at that time they decide like 17 seats will be for Shia and 13 seats for like so to get some how kind much of for Kurds. Yeah, but like it's I like for me I was like 14 years old, it was the only time when I just like start hearing there are Sunnah, Shia, Kurds and stuff. Like right. Yeah. So, if we, if we think about this, um, how people's decision making can be misguided by two messy emotions, sort of. I mean, I think like one thing you have said, Hassan, quite a few times that you, there is an uh, Iraqi author that you refer to every once in a while that unfortunately, unfortunately not has been translated to. Yeah, to his name is Ali Luardi. He's writing like s- s- very nice uh, like uh, books and articles. And like he, he's the guy who said like that, there, yeah, he, that you, you guys in Iraq, you have these religious idiots there who would vote for a religious party. And but go they, live somewhere else. Yeah, so, and then when the religious party is fucking up the country, they would be the first one to go to a secular country and then started preaching religion there. Yeah, actually we have yeah. some of them here. So we, have, like we have some kind of similar mentality around here somewhere. I mean, I guess the, the kind of people, you find them everywhere, sort of. But since this is a balanced society, we don't have any major crisis, except that our government make, have wanted to make or think we have like a major major economic crisis and uh, the Peru Somalis have tried to convince us we have a major crisis of of immigration which I have a very two very peaceful Middle Easterners here <laughs> discussing at this table I don't see the crisis of that anywhere right now even if the discussion is very heated around here I mean in the Finnish society but yeah Jalal you wanted to address integration and kind of this discussion what do you want to do? Well, first I want to congratulate Hassan for having his uh, permission now. He can relax. Finally. And now yeah. we got finally yeah. into the integration kind of system here. Because for two years waiting for asylum without any access to any integration services, a country like ours could do a little bit better. Well, integration, back to that. Yeah, but the, yeah, yeah, this is my first question. Question: I wanted to see that how Hassan feels now after now. He feels now he can live in here in peace. And do you have any plan for this? Probably you have been talking with foreigners before in here that they have lived before you in Finland and how difficult life is in here and how you are planning your life in Finland. But then when it comes to me, that if I want to talk about my own experience of integration in Finland, that's a long, long discussion and long, long story. Maybe we can but make uh, one program uh, about that yeah, at some point. Definitely we can make a two hours program about it. But yeah, first, first, if you can just tell me that, how do you feel uh, now? Well, of course I feel so much better because yeah. like, you know, it's like I was limited for everything, like limited access to everything, like you can't get into these proper courses and stuff. And I think like also the integration is not all about this uh, offices that get you to an integration yeah, but plan. Access to the yeah, access, access is to like to very bank, important. Bank account, yeah. To the ban more banal thing, bars, 
yeah, but still like, have, yeah, so even have, like, so, like sometimes I can't buy cigarettes. So, for yeah, yeah, especially like, when you have shaved your yeah, beard. Yeah, I shaved my beard. I can't buy cigarettes <laughs> even if I'm 26 years old. Yeah, I mean this kind of things are uh, challenging. But like integration. Yeah, for two years, that's a long time. Yeah, for two time. years. Yeah, it's mm. like uh, it's so frustrating. Yeah, it's like to be living as a second class citizen. Yeah, for it's that like long. for me, I start working since I was 13 years old after back the war. In Iraq, yeah, yeah, back in Iraq. And I was like working and studying most of the time, even at the university, I was working after the university. So it was like the only two, the last years here, it was the only year that I feel like. You have done nothing. No, you yeah, have, you haven't had access to even kind of get to know, uh, get to do something, that something has been limiting you and you haven't had access to the society. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but otherwise, like you uh, have a lot of Finnish friends, like uh, it's like, uh, uh, it's like, w- you can't rely only on the integration because like now I know so much people, I have so much contact, I have done yeah. so many voluntary work with yeah. uh, like uh, thanks to Obo Academy, like it was the first place where like I got to know. Yeah, like, we, uh, we kind of picked you guys there like <laughs> those ones speak English, let's take them to a project <laughs> here. And then you were the recruiter for our, <laughs> for yeah. so that and so that the silent like guys wouldn't yeah, get when you crazy. Mentioned, when you mention speaking English, like the language is so important. We yeah, only yeah. have to like communication language because like also a lot of uh, like let's say fights or misunderstanding yeah. start from misunderstanding. Like so, like two people speak different languages, no one get yeah like understand the other they start shouting and then like yeah so like sometimes when you talk with someone you understand this guy like he understands you or she or something then like it's so much easier so yeah so the language is a very important thing and uh, as it is right now in finland um as long as you only have asylum seeker status that you haven't gotten your your asylum decision yet, you are not entitled to any integration services, including language education, unless volunteers are coming with for their like free will or f- their good will to teach. But that's only up to. But no, no legal access to integration and the asylum process right now in Finland can take a very long time. Some people that's have been waiting. two years. That's so. It's quite a long, <laughs> quite a long time to be living on the margin or yeah. outside the margin of the society and not have access to kind of normal life functions like, a, like a validate your driver's license, a, dr- a bank account, all kinds of stuff. But um, more than language, what's important for integration? Hmm. Yeah, I think the language is the first thing, then... And to be treated well, right? Yeah. I mean, if people are yeah, speaking and shouting like and sh- y- showing f- ugly faces to you on the street, you're not going to be very hap- like, happy like, about yeah, being Yeah, even here. like with your ability to learn the language, like, you will we'll not get so motivated to right. learn the language when you like... Right. Uh, but uh, but you, you mentioned that uh, people being angry at you with an angry face in the street, um, yeah, I mentioned it. That's yeah, an example but, of racism. But, I don't know if your racism but, looks like that. But, but you, and you ask what more is needed besides the language yeah. is also willing to be open-minded about integration, to to understand the uh, local culture and local value. So you're, s- and you're uh, saying like you you um, you want to say that people have some responsibility to open up to this new society. Definitely. Yeah. And then when. I haven't seen that much through 23 years angry faces to me, but <laughs> if if I uh, it was just by ex- by my example. I don't know really but because I'm not the target for racism. I'm target for sexism. Like men can behave like <laughs> shit just yeah. because I'm a woman, <laughs> but it's kind of a different thing. But I don't. I'm not the target for racism. Well, it was. I don't know what yeah. it looks like exactly. Um, but I, I've heard many foreigners are mentioning about this racism industry. Uh, and I always say that as um, as much as you are afraid of immigration and starting a new life, so they are afraid also of you as strangers or us as strangers. Yeah. And of course, they have a right to have that fear, but it needs a kind of education about it. Uh, immigration and also strangers and things like that. And Finland is quite new country uh, country to foreigners actually. It's uh, since 90s, the, uh, Finland started to accept more 
refugees or um, more immigrants. Yes, sort of. And we are a little bit like socially a little bit difficult as it is. Mm -hmm. And that's that's quite natural for some of them to be afraid. And it just needs time. It just needs time to to um, for for many local people to understand the benefit of and immigrants. patience on both sides, yeah, yeah. both the receiving and the received. Yeah. So this will be the last the, clo the closure for this time we are we we are running out of time. So next week you will hear us again. You have been listening to Radio Robin Hood Conversation Oasis coming to you here from Kasviskeda's restaurant in the city center of Turku. You have he heard Jalal, Branku, Hassan and me Nana Blomqvist here today. And next week you will hear some of us again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.